capital helps produce human capital. Correct. That's true at a country level where when you have a more human capital in the population, it can help create the next generation of human capital. Right. But it's also true with an individual. That yes. if an individual hasn't accumulated human capital by this point in their life, it's harder to then add exactly. to it. Exactly. That's one of the lessons that comes out of the human capital approach that literally, I mean, the term sometimes uses dynamic complementarity, but what it really means it gets harder and harder to remediate at older ages. It's harder to learn something completely new. And if you start with a low skill base when you're in your middle age, you're just not going to adapt that well. I mean, we tried this with job training programs for people who are, you know, in their mid-40s when steel mills closed. A lot of those guys who were laid off from a steel mill simply didn't want, you know, they just they found it hard to learn. They didn't want to learn how to program. But a kid, a baby, a kid who's six, three months old, six months old, six years old is much more flexible. And so we know that programs that are operating earlier, and that's the same phenomena you're talking about. You know, the so-called Matthew effect people talk about. So to those who are given, more will be given. It's true that somebody who is highly educated can generally benefit more, right? So we know that actually, even among retired people, or even people in the late 60s, the BLS had this study about who was engaged in learning. 60-year-old, 60 65-year-old accountants and doctors and people who were they were actively engaging and, and taking courses, online courses, taking, you know, recertification courses, trying to get current in their fields. Partly because of intellectual curiosity, but partly for staying active in their field. But that kind of training really dies off rapidly at that age for less educated people. And so it gets very difficult to change. And uh, that's one of the hard lessons in life. Uh, but you're actually right. So I would use the phrase skills beget skills, and these things are dynamic. They create the platform for learning more. So it's, it may be even an unstable process in the sense, right, we just, we keep learning and we learn more and it gets easier to learn. And so it is all this, something like an increasing returns phenomenon. Well, people live a long time. So we have this pipeline of people, maybe who we fail. Let's say we fail. They didn't fail, we fail them. They're right. 30 years old. Yes. They've didn't get the education they should have gotten, they didn't get the other skills they should have gotten. Maybe it's all our fault. Let's just assume it's all our Suppose fault. We, is, we yeah. did, they're 30. What do we do? It's probably less of a skill-based policy at that point because the learning may not be as effective. But in terms of this business of engagement, I think you incentivize them to work and you acquire the skills. I mean, this is something, you know, Ned Phelps and many, many people, people around Gary, yourself, many people have written on this notion and that is, is it better to pay people to just kind of be idle? Or to you know, say, well, look, maybe you're not quite up to par in terms of the wage. We can give you an extra incentive. So instead of paying you a full dollar just to work, we might pay you 30 cents more to work. That may make up the difference between your lower level of productivity and what might be required on the job and make you more employable. And it would engage you, and I think would have a huge set of social benefits. Something like the Earned Income Tax Program does exactly that. It's giving people incentives to work. I think that the incentive-based approach, which is engaging people rather than kind of putting them off to the sideline, is going to be far more effective. And I think there would be some learning by doing, but frankly, most of the estimates I've seen suggest it's not that big. Once you get to that point. Once you get to that point. Right? Let me talk about sure. a couple of ideas that come to my mind and get your reaction to those ideas. One of which is very closely related is, is this idea of call it a demand side policy, that yes. we're going to drag, you know, and, and, and to some extent we saw that Sweden did this, they wanted to raise the wage of women and they did it a lot, to some extent with a demand side policy where they said we're going to find tons of jobs for, to hire women into the government to do right. child care and other things and they were very successful at improving labor market opportunities for women partly through those kind of policies. Right. So one idea would be to try to do something similar to that get more male participation, low-skilled males. Is there, is there an analog there? Let me throw that one out. Let me well, I, I would want to separate make work when you were mentioning No, I don't, want to, I don't <laughs> want to make work is maybe not, but, but is there something 
that can work to bring people into the labor market as a way of raising their earnings as opposed to giving them higher, more money and pushing them effectively out. Well, you can make them more, more attractive to employers. I mean, yeah, exactly. The cost to them is, is, the cost to the employer is lower. It's not the nominal wage, it's the wage. So there'd be, I wouldn't want to call it a subsidy. I guess it would be a subsidy in some sense. There would be an incentive given that would reckon. So if we have a minimum wage, I mean, it's a whole issue whether we should, but suppose you have a minimum wage, and some workers simply aren't at that level of ability. Uh, they, they simply aren't going to make up. Then the question is, if we want them to have a certain level of income, should we just have all that in transfer? Or should we give them that fraction of the income they would get to incentivize them and their employer to hire them to get the job, so to, to take the job? So I think, I think there's a big gain to be made by kind of exploiting those margins. That's just simple economics. Right? I agree. I agree. And that, that is a situation where we're not, and a lot of these people who are not working are not necessarily families with children. A lot of these are people who are oh. not working at all. In fact, the majority of them are, are in, in, for at least among the males in that group that aren't working, would require a different kind of program. Right, what it, kind of what program. it would affect them and draw them into the labor market. Right. Let me give you a second policy, though, that I think. But by the way, I wouldn't say we always want to bring everybody into the labor market, though. There is a question. That's another hotly debated topic, which is not completely clear. You could argue, and some people have argued, that it might be much better in some cases for the people to stay at home, especially, for example, if it's women raising kids and they're playing a role, that that non-market productivity frequently doesn't get counted as something really positive. And uh, some people would argue that's maybe neglected. I'm very suspicious of some of these determinants that we have to have exactly X percent of people working, as if Formal employment is actually the whole productivity in the economy. I think your, your term earlier, engaged, is engaged. really the key. They exactly. have to be engaged, engaged in, in a viable activity, whether a it's in the activity. household, whether it's exactly. in the marketplace, exactly. whatever it is. Now, let me come back. Let's assume we're successful at helping people at the younger ages who are more malleable, who really could yeah. take advantage of these opportunities. That is indirectly going to help the older less educated, less skilled people by eliminating some competition for them in the labor market. That is reducing the supply of those less of unskilled, of unskilled workers, right. which will sure. benefit the people who maybe whose skills you couldn't augment. That Correct. is, you don't have to pull everybody out of the low Correct. skilled pool to help everybody in the low skilled pool. No, oh, that would be a benefit. This is something that's gonna be really true, like for example, in China right now, when you have like a declining population, an aging population. If you educate the Chinese workforce and you get more educated kids, you're gonna have less competition for these older unskilled, these are not just all the retired, so it's not all a retirement yep. issue. And at the same time, you're gonna be able to support this, uh, the social infrastructure for you know, maintaining the retirement. So there are benefits that percolate across the, the skill market. And people typically don't look at those. I agree. I think that's an important point because, you know, people say, well, this, this human capital strategy is going to fail because I can't help everybody. There's a bunch of people who can't move. And the point is they get helped when you move other people. Correct. And I think that's often forgotten. And one thing I think we've learned is that these supply and demand dynamics matter in these markets. Oh, for sure. When you have more unskilled workers, the unskilled wage is going to go down. When you have more skilled workers, the un relative to unskilled, it's going to move the opposite way. Right. Now, I think, but see, what you're getting at, I mean, think about calculations and debates that go on in the U.S. Treasury, where they won't even take into account any incentive response of a tax increase or a tax change. So I mean, what's the name of it? There's a name given for this where they're basically... Dynamic scoring. Scoring, something like that. Yeah. So a dynamic score. But it's basically something so alien that incentives are there. But if you look at labor market effects or just general market effects, they're huge. And it's very difficult to communicate those. And I think it may be getting harder in the public dialogue. People want very simple answers, very naive answers about we're going to fix inequality, we're going to fix this or fix that without looking at all of the larger implications within the market and then the larger society. Mm -hmm.